So uh, welcome ev everybody to the next session, uh, for the pre which is named Precision Medicine and Biobanking. Uh, I guess uh, we all know the rules now for the speakers. Uh, try, uh, let's try to s stick to the time, uh, 15 minutes for each speaker. And we decided that we will uh, have the questions after each talk. So uh, um, uh, I, I think there is a plenty of time also devoted to the uh, question and answers. So when I, it is my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, uh, Lars uh, Bambush, uh, who is a senior scientist at the Department of Pediatric uh, Research, Division of Pediatric and uh, Adolescent Medicine, Oslo University Hospital. I know this is not the first time you are in Riga, so uh, welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. It's actually a very great pleasure to be back here in Riga. So we have heard a Sorry, a lot about pediatric cancers in the previous session, so I won't to uh, repeat most of it. So in Norway, we have about 200 cases every year, making it to the dominant cause of death by disease among children uh, above one year of age. And despite uh, that there are good treatment opportunities, we still have very uh, different high-risk subgroups with relapse or resisting disease. And we all know that childhood cancers are different from adult cancers. They have different cure rates, they have different genetic background and different frequencies. So what you can see here with the adults, we have the breast and prostate cancer and lung cancer, but the childhood cancer, we have ALL and brain cancer. So we started our initiative actually when we read about the American Pediatric Cancer Genome Project, which was established in 2010. So about that time, we became aware at our university hospital that for the adult cancer, there were different biobanks, different sequencing projects available and up and running. But there was nothing like that for childhood cancers. So there was a lack both of the infrastructure, but as well, especially a general informed consent. So at that time, when the parent came there with their child, they had to sign different papers for different projects. And if you are in this vulnerable situation, it's of course crucial if people coming with different papers. So we said, okay, we need one general informed consent and that will then lead to all the different research projects. So we started then with our biobank and I think that's also very crucial. We had some people which were dedicated to it. So I would say the requ uh, requirements for a general biobank is that you really have people who see the demand, who see what is necessary, and that you also have an administration supporting it. The next step is that you need collaboration. So of course you have different departments and all of them have to work together. You have the oncology ward, you have the pathology, but you also need lab facilities who can treat and handle the different uh, samples in the correct way. Before you start biobanking, you need approvals. You need the ethical committee to approve for the biobanking, you need the administration, you need a data safety board, and you need operation procedures. But you need also an infrastructure. So you need people who know what is biobanking, how to treatment. For example, we are treating all of our samples within one hour. So when you get the samples, everything is then aliquoted and put into the freezer within this time frame. But you have to be aware of these kind of things if you are working with biobanking. You have to be aware how to register a patient, how to handle things, and how to store it correctly. And of course, you need funding. And that was also a problem for us in the beginning, that we needed some funding who support the biobanking uh, as a so what we built then is a consortium. So, and we started actually um, first at our university hospital in Oslo. So we started here and we got our infrastructure up and running at our hospital. And then after some time, we invited as well the other university hospitals in Bergen, in Trondheim and in Schumse, and all of them contribute now to the biobank. 
And what was also very important was who owns the biobank. So now it's a share between all the university hospitals or it's in a way in consortium itself. So it's not that it the samples do not belong to Oslo or to one of the other hospitals, but it's a combined uh, effort and a combined utilization of these samples. And we also we have an advisory board which looks at the scientific questions and we have a steering committee who meets twice a year. And what you can see here, so we are collecting in all of the different locations and some of the uh, special treatments are only done in Oslo while the others are storing at their, uh, their locations and then everything is transported to Oslo for further um, uh, work on the different downstream analysis part. So if you look at our pipeline, of course, in the beginning, you have the informed consent. And that's also a question often. So in, in Norway, it's compulsory that both parents are signing the informed consent. And that was where in, during the pandemic, it was quite difficult then to get both parents at the ward. Then you have the registration and the transport. And then is the next question, what to collect? So we try to collect really everything we can get hold of. So from blood, urine, stool sample, and uh, hair, whatever we can get hold on. So that's now our pipeline. So we have the different university hospitals. We have a registration at each side. Then we have the processing and the, in the control lab. And then we have the long-term storage. And then we have the different research trials and translational research. So then we have the exchange again with the hospital, depending on which uh, research question they are working on. This is to show you how our registration looks like. So when we, so that's on a separate server. And that's the different uh, topics which you register, so gender, ethnicity, uh, metastasis, and other medications, and so on. So we have a uh, long list what we are registering in our database. This is our status today. So we have now included over 730 patients. And we are very proud of that because over 95% of, uh, of all patients which are asked to contribute are willing to do so. And of course, the majority is ALM, LLL. We have AML so, and a large portion of solid patients. And it's a little bit hard to read. So we have in one of our first publications, which came out last year, we have also looked at the 501st patients. So where you can see the distribution of the different solid tumors seen as leukemia and other types. That's what we are collecting. As I said, we are trying to collect everything, full blood, plasma, serum, Buffy code, and that makes it also different from other biobanks, from, for example, the adult biobanks. Some of them are only collecting the tumor material and blood. We have also an addition bone marrow when we can get hold of it, spinal fluid, tumor tissue, salvia, urine, feces, hair, germline DNA tumor DNA and tumor RNA. And that was also a question in the beginning. Should we extract it up front or should we first collect it and do the extraction later on? And we have a new project where we now collect living cells from the bone marrow and to put them in the minus 150 freezer to have living cells from these patients where we can get hold of. And today we have 70,500 samples, which we can now use for research. And I mean, one thing is that we have these samples, but we are also very proud that we are one of the first national biobanks. So most of the adult biobank, cancer biobanks are only localized in one hospital, but we are really national wide. And that took some time to get the trust that we can really collect everything together at one place. That's our homepage, so um, where you can ex get access to it. And then you can see we also have the different projects located there. And these are one of the first projects which we started. And I want to introduce to, to one of the projects, which is called Inform. And so there, Monica Montecos is the PI of it. And 
The biobank that we have, the infrastructure of the biobank was a real prerequisite that we could do or be part of this project. So in form, we will hear more about it, I think, tomorrow. It's an extended genomic and molecular characterization of children with relapsed or refractory cancers. So where you have come to an end of your therapy, and the hope of it is that you get improved treatment through participation in targeted clinical trials. So what we are doing, we take, we're using the infrastructure of the biobank, we're collecting the samples, and then it's sent to Heidelberg where the rest of the analysis is done. But you can only do that if you have the infrastructure of the biobank. What I would like to discuss with you today is also how to continue. Because now I think we are in a kind of a uh, crossroad where we should, uh, where we're discussing internally as well how to continue, and that I would like to share with you. For example, with the DNA and RNA extraction. So we are doing that now routinely, but we all know that if you put the RNA sample in the freezer, it's not as stable as uh, DNA. So is it really wise to do that? What about sequencing? At the moment, we can't afford upfront sequencing, but it would be wise to do so. Should we then start with exome sequencing? Should we start with whole genome sequencing? We don't know. Quality control is a big issue for us. So we have now started with some quality control for DNA. So there we have an experiment where we have put in a large bulk of DNA and we're taking out a DNA sample every three months or every six months and we are testing the quality of it. But how to assess the quality? Is it only the amount? Is it that you put it on a gel? Is it that you're looking for some specific mutations? It's hard to know. And then as well, should we only look for DNA? Should we be starting with the same for RNA? Maybe we should do it for protein or the metabolomics. So how to know that in five years from now on or 10 years, your sample which you collected today is as good as it was when you started with your biobank? Long time storage. You see here this fantastic facility. At the moment, we are only storing it in one facility, but we also got the offer to share a place in a robot. Should we do so? What would be the best then to access the samples in the future? It's really hard to know. Should we be part of a larger biobank, uh, like um, the adult biobanks, or should we try to keep it separately? Childhood cancer is different. We're collecting it differently. We get smaller amounts at different time points. So this is quite challenging for us to get it through. Financing. At the moment, each new project has to pay around 1,000 euros to start it for the biobank. In a way, it's nothing if you look how much we spend for the freezers and for the staff and so on. Should we have a different system? Uh, how to put fees on the people which are using our samples. How to make that fair? Should it be cheaper for national-wide use than for international use? I don't know. And then as well, how to guarantee that we can use our samples in a wise way, in a good way? How to share it when we get requests from international organizations? How can we put up good organization? How is it with the data return? If you're running, if one researcher is running a sequencing project, is he obliged then to send the data back and in which time frame, or should we do it for him or her? And the other thing is, how should we use the limited material? Often you have only a needle bi biopsy of a patient. Should we wait? Should we collect it until we have a certain amount of patients? Or should we use it now, today? And that's a, maybe a typical Norwegian question, because as you know, we have a lot of money from oil and gas, but we're putting it into the bank, not using it for investments. Maybe that's the wrong way. Maybe we should use, start to use not only the oil and gas, but also the biobank bio material today. I want to summarize to say biobanking is more than just collection of some samples.
What we learned with our biobank is that the synergy effect which we had with our colleagues, that we are really trying to have a combined research effort of the different university hospitals. And that's what is so brilliant or what is really encouraging us to continue with this work. But as I said, we are now working on how to use the samples in a good way, how to use the infrastructure which we have established so far in a good way and to keep on with the synergy effect of our collaborations. And we are asking ourselves what should be the focus, the aim and the strategy for our bank in the future. And I want uh, to end with uh, to thank my colleagues, uh, Monica. So Monica is a PI and I'm in the co-PI of this biobank. Then we have a, a study nurse and coordinator of the biobank, Nina, and we have a technician, which and all of them are very dedicated to our biobank. And here you can see all the different people from Trondheim, Berg and Trumso and all working together. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you, Lars. Okay, uh, now, now, now the floor is open for uh, questions. Okay, maybe I can start. Uh, I, I know how difficult it is sometimes, especially, especially with, uh, with initiatives which, where you don't uh, get a lot of funding up front. It's difficult to convince all the, all the participants to really uh, collaborate. Uh, was it easy? How it uh, was in your case? Yeah, it, it was difficult and it is still difficult. So at the moment we are financed mainly through the Childhood Cancer Society. And they financed uh, our administrator and the study nurse for three years, but after that we don't know. And we, have, we are discussing it with our clinic because we think that a biobank should be part of a clinic or should be part of our university hospital. But of course we have, I think, 20 to 40 different biobanks. It's difficult to finance all of them. But we are negotiating that we get more funding and more staff for the biobanks. But then again, if you're, if you get financing support from your clinic, you also have to show that you are using it, that you are producing publications, that you are coming out the research um, success of your biobank. So I think it's also, yeah, you are obliged then to show that you are uh, using the money wisely. Okay. Yeah. Uh Oh, there is a question. Yeah, thanks, yeah, well. thanks, Lars. Uh, uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I will ask a, again provocative question based on the slide which you show perspectives for discussion, and you posed really uh, important questions. Now, my question is. How are you going to find the answers for those questions, and how long it will take? Because uh, the question is, are you going to do that? in silo on a country level to find those answers or are you seeking some international like perspectives and uh, and like consensus yeah so actually i'm just uh, coming back from a meeting in trumso where i meet some of my colleagues so we have this steering board committee and i think inside the steering board committee we have these these discussions and there we decide in a way and there we have representatives from all university hospitals. So we decide in a way together what we to, uh, want to do and what we want to achieve for the future. But of course, if you have 10 different people, you have several different opinions. So some of us, <laughs> some want to keep it in the biobank for the moment and others say, okay, let's start. Let's do some, uh, some more research, even if we are using up some of the samples. So both sides. So I think we have we come to an agreement in the end and maybe the majority then will decide what to do. Okay, yeah. next so, question. Yeah, thank you um, for the very informative uh, presentation. So I was wondering, uh, as INFORM for example is a study of course for the relapsed uh, refractory patients. So um, how are you now linked with this uh, adult uh, uh, precision medicine uh, studies and clinical trials, which we will hear more about tomorrow in Norway, and what is like your future plan for that, also for the primary primary cancers, and yeah, would yeah. be nice. To yeah. So actually, uh, so the Oslo University Hospital 
it's in a way there are three different hospitals. So one is a radium hospital where they only treat adult cancers, and we have the Rix Hospitale where we only treat childhood cancer. So in a way we have a, two different localizations, but we try to interact, of course, with them. So we are part of some uh, of studies there. So we have interaction, and what we want to do for in the future. I mean, now we are part of Inform. Inform is brilliant, but we have to bring it back to Norway. We have to learn our lesson and we have to establish in a way a pipeline which is similar to inform. I think it's important to have that as well in house. So we are trying now, we are running it a little bit in parallel. So some of our samples are done both in Heidelberg and in Oslo and we're comparing the results and we will see if maybe we manage in the future that uh, we get it as well established there. But of course, 200 samples it's not that many, or 200 cases is not that many. We still need the expertise from others. Uh, and kind of additional question, yeah. prom promoting one. So as, as we have now here, many people from Nordic and Baltic countries, would you say that there would be a, a kind of place for collaboration as well? Of course, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. So uh, I forgot to mention, I mean, the next speaker is from the Swedish Charter to Mobile Bank. When we started, we went to Sweden. We asked them, how are you doing it? We learned a lot. So we are very, very thankful to the Swedish Biobank. So uh, they told us that they do things a little bit differently, but without them, we couldn't have started. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, and with this word, I can introduce the next speaker. <laughs> yeah which is Johanna Sanken. So I'm very happy to hear you because I know that you're doing things a little bit differently and I think that's all that's important that we're not doing everything the same way. Yes. So please. Yes, thank, thank you very much. And that was a very good transition also to my talk, thanks. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about the Swedish Childhood Tumor Biobank and it's called Van. I think we can't hear you. Are, is it on? Yeah. Stand closer maybe, Ah, oh, sorry. So it's called Bantum Banking in Swedish, we usually say BTB. So it's a natural sample collection and a genomic characterization initiative of pediatric solid tumors for research purpose. And I also have an introductory slide about pediatric cancer. So in Sweden, we have a bit larger population than Norway. So we have 340 children every year diagnosed with cancer. One third are leukemias and two third are uh, different solid tumors. And today, more than 85% of these patients survive. And it's, it's still, though, the major cause of disease-related death uh, among kids. And I also have some survival curves here uh, for several decades back. And you can see for uh, several diagnoses has been a plateau here in regards of survival. And also the survivors often suffer from side effects from the current treatment. And moreover, as you all know, I guess, childhood tumors differ from the adult forms. They have different biological origin um, because they occur during development. And they also, in general, have much less genetic aberrations and also seem to interact less with the immune response. So overall, then, uh, of course, more research are needed on these malignancies. So that's what the big reason then to form the Swedish Childhood Tumor Biobank, and that was around 10 years ago. So as Lars said, we started some years before in Sweden. And here are some points then about uh, BTB, the, the Tumor Biobank. So it's a research and healthcare oriented biobank infrastructure. It's situated in Stockholm, Karolinska Institutet. And it's a natural sample collection for whole Sweden for pediatric solid tumors. And we collect most materials as fresh frozen. And the sample collection was established at the Karolinska University Hospital in Stockholm. And what we do is, done, uh, is also then genomic characterization of the, of the collected biobank samples. And one important aim then for, for the biobank is to be able to distribute these samples and also the generated data to research projects. And we are fully funded by the Swedish Childhood Cancer Fund and has been uh, all over the years. So the overall aim is then to support research, to increase the understanding of these childhood tumors so it can lead to enhanced survival and quality of life for these children. 
so some more details about uh, the B2B. So, of course, we are a, a biobank, so we register the samples. We have a limb system for that. We prepare and, and store them. And we do then the molecular and genomic analysis. So what we do is the whole genome sequencing of the tumor and blood samples. We do RNA sequencing and also methylation arrays. And then we also develop an informatic pipeline so we can interpret the results um, from this data. So we have a pipeline for whole genome sequencing called SARIC and different pipelines for the RNA data. And that we do together with this big life science infrastructure in Sweden called Science for Life Laboratory, which also do the sequencing for us. And what we provide is then service to different clinical study, collaboration to, to researchers, but of course also we have this formal process so researchers can apply to us and get access to the samples and to the, to the data. And of course you need an ethical permit for your research project. And then we then have this uh, crucial collaboration with the six Swedish university hospitals that operate and treat these uh, children in Sweden. And you can see where they are on this map of Sweden different cities here and then we collaborate with the different departments, the pediatric oncology, the surgery and the pathology to receive the blood samples, the informed consent of course and, and the tumor tissue and also the, some clinical information about diagnosis. Uh, I will tell you some more about the sample types later. Uh, so what about the sample collection? So as I said we had been ongoing for a bit more than 10 years. So here you can see the, some bar graphs of how many cases uh, we collect each year, how many patients. So we started with CNS tumors, the blue part of the bars, and then we continue with other solid tumors around 2015. And we collect from almost all children with a solid tumor in Sweden. We get the biobank sample and a, and a consent. And here is also a table for the status uh, about a month, month back um, that we have overall collected 1,860 uh, cases. And we also have written here that we have uh, paired blood and tumor cases from 1,173, which is important when you do whole genome sequencing, you need a germline and a, and a tumor sample for that. And we also have the numbers for the different centra, and of course they differ depending on how many patients are referred to the different centra. So, uh, some more words about the sample collection. So that was the number of cases. And we have now around 23,000 samples collected since we get several samples from each patient and also different sample types. And we do DNA and RNA extraction uh, in the B2B lab. And so we have, in addition for those samples, then almost 21,000 early codes of DNA and RNA in the freezers. And some more words about the sample types in the other part of this slide. So as I said, we collect uh, fresh frozen solid tumors, which is important for the DNA RNA quality since we're doing the genomic analysis. And we collect the patient matched blood samples. We also collect CSF. We also accept some formerly paraffin embedded tissue collect some diagnostic slides, and we also get fresh tumor from some centra so we can isolate viable uh, tumor cells. And we also can collect some hair and, uh, and uh, saliva as well. And also we collect the blood from all the parents, which is important if you're interested in the inheritance of the cancer disease. And lastly, on this slide is also that we have ethical permit and patient consent to collect uh, CNS reference cases, which are then from patients that are not suspected to have a, a tumor, a brain tumor, and they are operated due to other causes like epileptic seizures. So this could be like a reference tissue for, for brain tumors that could be aged, aged match also. So we are then a population-based sample collection of solid tumors in children. So the pie charts here show the proportion of the different diagnoses in the biobank for the CNS tumors and the other solid tumors that fits well then with the incidence of these diagnoses. Um, we'll now switch a bit to the genomic part of the work. So we'll be mostly talking about the biobanking and sample handling. And as I said, we do the different uh, genomic characterization, the whole genome sequencing, RNA sequencing, methylation arrays, 
And then we then collect a lot of big data that we need to store and process, of course, and we do that mostly internally at KI, but we also use some external uh, infrastructures in Sweden um, for this. And then we do the bioinformatic analysis, as I told you. And then we have data sets that we can and have now also distributed to authorized researchers when they apply to us. But I also want to mention here that we, since a few uh, years back, also collaborate with the Genomic Medicine Sweden initiative, that is then to implement the whole genome sequence in the clinic that uh, David Giseson talked about earlier today. So BTB is also part of this study, and then we work closer to the hospital. And one important task for us is then to also to store this generated data for secondary use in, in, in research. So that data uh, also is deposited at, at BTB. So how much data do we have now? So this is only the BTB data, not uh, GMS data. So we have uh, sequenced around 600 cases, and this is ongoing. We will do another 150 this year. So in these bars, you see the whole genome for the tumor and blood and the RNA sequencing. And around 400 cases, we have profiled the methylation arrays, since we only do that on CNS tumors, and now also sarcoma, since they are also classified for those diagnoses. And I also mentioned the informed study here, as also Lars talked about. Uh, since we, since 2016 in Sweden, are a national hub for those patients in regards of handling the samples and sending them to Heidelberg for this molecular genetic analysis. And the idea is also here that we also can actually get this data back because they are doing similar analysis as we do in the biobank, and then we don't have to do the double analysis with the piece that we have in the biobank, so we can save material and share data. But there are some legal issues to this also to share data, but that is the plan, and we have done more than 200 uh, of those patients for the informed study. And here I also mentioned the bioinformatic pipelines that we have that are also open source. And also one slide that we are preparing a manuscript about the Swedish Isle Tumor Biobank and to describe the work and the workflow. And also we have done an in-depth analysis of 82 CNS tumors to show the research and clinical utility of this. So this is one figure from this manuscript showing all the 82 different tumor cases and the important mutations found in them. And uh, I also want to mention then, since I said at the beginning, important then to distribute the samples and the data to a researcher, and we started to do that some years back. So we have this process for this, we can apply to B2B, and there will be a scientific evaluation of the projects, a medical legal review, and of course we check if we, the sample data uh, are available for this project. And so far, we have had 10 approved research projects uh, for, um, within Sweden. So this is a table of the 10 projects going to different universities in Sweden with uh, different applications and different projects. There are uh, methylation studies, there are spatial gene expression, single cell RNA, uh, xenograph studies, cell-free tumor DNA studies. And they have received tumor, uh, tumors and, and data from BTB. And we have more applications ongoing, and this is something we will work more on now to receive more applications. So the data and samples can actually be used for research progress. And we also then assist different clinical studies in regards of sample handling and, and also some genetic analysis. Like the INFORM I mentioned, we also help a cerebellar mutism syndrome study, with, where the study center is in Copenhagen. And as I mentioned, this GMS childhood cancer study, which is a natural study. We will also aid four more studies this year. And these are all uh, international or natural studies that we support in the field of pediatric cancer. And previously, we have supported the Biomed and CUPNET uh, studies. So, uh, and of course, we are several dedicated people working with the, the, the Biobank. They are listed here. And of and we have the good collaboration with all the six centres that we also have on this slide. And of course, we're also dependent on external collaborators and the funding agency, the Child of Cancer Fund, over here. So, thank you very much for your attention. Okay. The this paper is now open for discussions.
there any questions from the audience? If not, I want yeah, to start with, oops, with one question. So where do you see your future with the biobank? So will you continue sequencing all of the samples you get, or do you think you will take a selection that you only take uh, relapse samples or so on? So where will you see yourself for the biobank in 10 years? In ten, oh, ten or years, five to 10 years, uh, yeah. Um, and that's a good question, of course. So now the focus is to sequence what we have. We also got this special grant from the Childhood Cancer Fund to sequence what we have in the freezer. But now, since also the, the sequencing is done in the clinic with this GMS study, we, of course, will not do it on the same sample in the, in the biobank. So we're now discussing which other possibly methods we should use on the biobank samples, what the research community need. So of course, that's something we continuously think about, and also collecting different sample types and, yeah. So it's a good discussion, but we haven't decided yet. Mm. Yes, Hi, thank you for this great presentation. And <clears throat> I got particularly curious about that fresh frozen material part. How do you manage uh, the logistics to get the material immediately frozen and then transport it? And how does this work? Yes, from the six different centers also, yes, but we receive them in batches because this is for each research, so it's not for clinical use. So they freeze the samples locally and then they send them so three or four times a year. Uh, so it works fine, actually. Mm. And, and why, uh, what is better than taking a material in uh, like a stabilizing fluid, uh, like tumor material can be also stored for DNA <coughs> uh, extraction in, in just like a, a tube? And what is better in, in frozen? Uh, right now we just, they store it in a tube, so we get the frozen tissue to us, but we want also to be able to freeze it in media so we can also have viable cells in the tubes, but that requires some more protocol uh, than at the local centres. So right now they just freeze the tumour piece in minus 80 and send us to us on dry ice. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions? If not, I would like to announce the next... So thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Yeah, the next speaker is Yanis Kloven uh, here, the chairman of the Scientific Council of the Latvian Biomedical Research and Study Center, and as well as senior researcher of the Latvian Biomedical uh, Research and Study Center, and a professor of molecular biology here at the university. The last time I was here in Riga, I was shown around at the biobank, and one thing which impressed me most was the safe. So, so there was, <laughs> I remember they were shown that there it was previously a bank or something, so you had this huge save for the sample, so that really impressed me. So, please. Okay, we now move to another uh, building, so it's, it's a bit different now, but yeah. Okay, um, uh, after having heard those really nice presentations uh, from the morning session and also today, I'm very happy to pre present the uh, Latvian case. So, and I will talk about the Latvian Pediatric Cancer Initiative uh, and uh, show some pilot project results. First of all, I would like to mention that uh, I'm speaking on behalf of uh, Monta Brivib, uh, who is in charge of this project. She is a coordinator of this project, but uh, since she is now at home uh, with the two weeks old baby, so I'm, I'm presenting this, this uh, talk right now. Uh, so, and uh, the, the project I'm talking about is um, uh, was devoted to really investigate what are our techni technical ca capabilities and uh, how we can actually uh, work towards the, to bring this precision medicine strategy in the treatment of pediatric uh, ma malignancies. More specifically, uh, the main goal was to develop the workflow uh, similar to what we have heard today from many uh, speeches uh, for molecular characterization of pe pediatric malignancies and of course the objectives are straightforward the, the one objective was to establish the cohort of pediatric oncology patients another perform large-scale genome analysis and then try to est establish a working group to really uh, uh, test and uh, look at the uh, possibility how these data can be used uh, and whether they can be used in uh, uh, clinical practice 
Uh, and of course, when you look at the tasks, they are very similar to other similar projects. So basically, you have to perform recruitment of the patient, starting from the collection of clinical material. Of course, uh, also all the legal uh, documentation has to be there, sample processing, sequencing, finally data analysis and interpretation. And now looking back uh, on the uh, on the on the results, actually I'm I'm, uh, I'm 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 quite amazed how fast we were able to organize this uh, uh, project because uh, uh, we uh, I first met with uh, um, uh, John Tully when we were discussing to to really how we can fund this project in uh, February 2019 and already in the. October 2019, uh, just a month after we uh, have received uh, ethics uh, uh, approval, we were able to, uh, to, to really uh, uh, show the first uh, uh, whole genome sequencing report. Uh, and, then, and then the things uh, were really moving quite fast. But the reason why it was so actually was because there was a really uh, uh, collaboration between different institutions. First of all, I should mention the uh, uh, Children Clinical University Hospital providing all the uh, recruitment of patients and collection of clinical material, uh, Biomed Biomedical Research and Study Center, which I'm res representing, uh, was responsible for the biobanking sequencing and data analysis uh, together with also scientists from um, main universities in Latvia. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, we also managed to have on board some uh, private companies like Smart Omica that uh, actually uh, provided some d data analysis and interpretation for some of the samples and uh, interesting project that was developed during the course of this uh, activity was establishment of the genome data network where MicroTIC and, uh, uh, and mobile telecommunication uh, provider LMT was uh, uh, working together to establish this uh, genome data network that I'll be talking in a, a minute later. But of course, uh, you need also infrastructures uh, to, to do these projects. And uh, the, the, the reason why we were uh, so uh, fast and efficient was that we already from 2006, we were uh, working in frame of uh, genome database of Latvian population, which is National Biobank, uh, starting from 2006, uh, which is uh, now already uh, uh, included more than uh, 38,000 participants in it. And the reason uh, uh, why uh, we, we were able to do it so efficiently also was that really all the, uh, all the procedures starting from the sample uh, collection, uh, ethics permit uh, and, and, and ethical approval uh, regulation was already in place uh, from the very beginning. So then basically all the, all the technologies were there also for the uh, sequencing and uh, other, other processes. Uh, I'm, I'm showing you the, just a few pictures from our new facility that were so they are recently upgraded uh, the, uh, sample storage system here, the biobank, also the uh, sequencing uh, facility or sequencing laboratory. So you see the two uh, main sequencers. This was the sequencer that was used for the, uh, for the for the for this project, and now we have also installed uh, MGI uh, T7 instrument that is, that's, that that is uh, in output more similar to to Illumina's uh, um, NovaSeq, uh, which which uh, will definitely also make this uh, process uh, cheaper and, 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 and possible also faster. Another important thing that uh, is uh, also having the uh, private uh, partners on board, uh, I, I would like to specifically mention the uh, MGI uh, uh, the company that provides the uh, high throughput sequencing technologies also for this project. And uh, I already mentioned the uh, genome data network that was initiative uh, from uh, two companies, Microtech and Lat Latvian Mo Mobile Telephone, that really uh, created the fast data uh, uh, network uh, between the major academic institutions uh, that were connected with the sequencing facility and also the uh, high performance computing center allowing to uh, enable these data transfers. Um, and uh, 
Uh, another important initiative is that these uh, local activities are also well linked together with the uh, European initiatives. And here I'm showing the uh, recently started project from the, to, to establish the Latvian genome variation reference in uh, frame of the genome of Europe that is now funded from the Recovery in the Science facility where we uh, uh, are aiming to uh, sequence more than 3,000 uh, uh, whole genome sequences from general population that can be used also in, in pro all projects uh, uh, since the uh, uh, population specific references are um, really needed for many genomic, genomic projects. Uh, more on the project results. Uh, so at the beginning, we established the workflows and procedu pr procedures for different tumor types. Um, and more, more specifically, so for the liquid tu tumors, we are uh, collecting uh, uh, from the blood, we are uh, directly isolating DNA. Um, also having the uh, uh, plasma and serum stored uh, uh, as, as, a, as a reference. So um, uh, DNA for the, for the liquid tumors, we are using saliva sample for, and the DNA isolated from saliva sample. And, uh, and, then, and then depending on the cancer type, we have a, a, either uh, lymph node biopsies or the uh, bone marrow uh, uh, biopsies uh, or material that we use both for the DNA and RNA isolation that is then processed through the, uh, for, to, to the uh, next generation sequencing, data processing and, and interpretation. Uh, that's, uh, for the solid tumors, we use the blood as a as a, uh, uh, this reference, reference uh, DNA for the, for, the, for the genomic DNA and uh, comparing, the, again, the DNA and RNA isolated from the uh, solid tumor, uh, then the workflow is the uh, uh, same. And all these samples then are stored uh, in number of aliquots in our biobank uh, according to the procedures that we have established. So what are the actual project results? Uh, you already saw in one of the previous uh, presentations that we managed to involve um, uh, close to 200 patients. So uh, uh, we have at least 181 patients uh, uh, from the oncology department at Children's Hospital involved in this project. And uh, knowing that uh, this project was started in 2019 and we have around 50 patients, new patients every year. So uh, you see that we uh, are uh, um, really have included the absolute majority of uh, childhood uh, cancer patients in our uh, project. So the uh, NGS, the whole genome sequencing analysis has been performed for 85 patients. Uh, uh, and for the cancer samples, for the cancer tissue, we uh, do at least uh, 70x coverage using 150 base pair, pair and uh, sequencing uh, for the, uh, for the uh, DNA extracted from the normal tissue or blood or saliva. Uh, we uh, use uh, at least uh, 35x coverage, while for the RNA-seq, we uh, do at least 100 million uh, uh, pair dent sequencing reads uh, to uh, uh, analyze them further. And for the specific needs of this project, we uh, decided to use commercial uh, software to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to really uh, uh, to get these results more in more standardized manner. And this, in this case, this is a QuietGen CLC genomics workbench. Um, uh, for some, uh, for some uh, more specific uh, st variants, like structural variants, we have the pipeline developed in house. And uh, similarly, for the uh, uh, for the uh, analysis of fusion genes, we also use the same uh, tool mentioned uh, before. So, an uh, important thing, the next thing is, of course, to bring these results to the clinicians. And uh, we were initiating this discussion of findings. Um, uh, the 
basically as a, as a, as a uh, uh, training to really see how these um, uh, data can be uh, applied to the uh, clinical uh, needs and, 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 and uh, to, to really uh, have this uh, connection between the uh, molecular biologists uh, and, and the clinicians from the other side. So discussing the clinical implications, looking at the viable clinical trials, both using the Quiagen clinical insight reports and also in some cases uh, the smartomic uh, uh, provided uh, in-depth analysis for some more uh, for, for, for number of samples to go, to go more deeply into the uh, results. Uh, so of course the sequencing data are also viable for research studies and uh, here you can see some just some uh, statistical data from uh, this uh, from the sequencing that we have done so far for example we have identified more than 192 pathogenic mutations uh, that can not always uh, were, were included in this uh, um, in these um, reports that are provided for, uh, with the commercial tool so this is additional information that can be used uh, either for the research studies or also to complement these um, these clinical reports. Uh, another study, as an example, we are, we, we are, we are now studying the fusion genes in all hematological cancers, uh, where you can see that there are different uh, 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 different amount of these fusion genes at different um, uh, cancer types, and also uh, looking at the uh, most frequent uh, fusions from which some of some of these are really known as a, as a, as a, uh, related to the uh, cancer cases. Uh, so at the end, I would really like to uh, point some achievements. So basically, we really, really met our goals. We established the most comprehensive national cohort of oncology patients in Latvia. Uh, we, uh, we were able to ensure the whole genome transcriptome sequencing for the large proportion of patients and also started to establish this framework for the, uh, for, to facilitate the use of uh, data uh, for clinical practice. Uh, as a future plans, of course, and this is the one of the occasions here uh, to really um, uh, continue to establish collaborations with, uh, with different institutions or consortium from abroad to do, uh, doing the same thing and then learning and exchanging uh, this experience. Uh, from the uh, more, uh, we also, of course, looking to to improve some sample processing time, which is the more, is something that is uh, really needed if you want to have these uh, data to be used for the for the clinical purposes. And uh, we are planning to include some other sample types, like stool sample, uh, and then perform metagenomic analysis. And of course, as already was mentioned in one of the previous talks, that uh, the establishment of the molecular tumor board that could be uh, one uh, um, body that can use these results is an absolute necessity in Latvia. And uh, with the last, on the last slide, I really would like to thank specifically people that were involved in the sample collection and in the, in, in the processing of the, of the samples. And of course, uh, uh, the, 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 the main uh, founder, Mikrotik and, and John Tully personally, who really uh, promoted all this uh, 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 idea on establishing this biobank and, and study. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Yanis. Uh, questions from the audience? On your last slide, you showed data sharing for future plans. Um, I mean, in Norway, we have a lot of restrictions when it comes to data sharing. How is it here? Is it easier to share data with other international research groups or inside the clinic? Uh, so far, the, the, there is a regulation in the law that, uh, in order to really send the data, data or samples abroad, we have to go through the uh, at least two committees. So basically, it's a genome uh, genome analysis committee, and then, uh, of course, the ethics committee. So in principle, it is possible. Uh, in the future, I, I, I really look on the initiatives like the One Million Genome Project and then GDI. 
um, network that is uh, now actually developing these practices for the federated uh, the data storage system. And uh, if, if such a thing would be in place and uh, regulated uh, with the um, common uh, regulation from the Europe, I think that would really s uh, put all the things in, in place and would really uh, facilitate the data sharing in it that would be more regulated. Yeah. Okay, so I just have to admit, I think it's really impressive how much you have achieved in so short time. I mean, <laughs> it took us several years to get our biobank established, so I think it's wonderful. I was a bit surprised too, but, <laughs> 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 but that's really thanks to these people I mean, and, and specifically uh, Monta, who really was organizing all these, these, these activities. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay, and then uh, uh, our next speaker is uh, Ero Punka uh, from Helsinki, uh, director of Helsinki Biobank. So please, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, so regards from Helsinki and thank you to the organizers for, for this opportunity to give a talk here. So um, I'm going to be telling you about our ongoing effort of uh, returning clinically relevant data from biobank projects to healthcare. So this is uh, our hospital, Helsinki University Hospital, where our biobank belongs to. And as you know, from the, as you see from the numbers, there is a huge potential for, for biobank samples and, and also biobank data. And uh, if you... <coughs> See here almost 3 million patient visits per, visit, visits per year. And you know that in Finland, the lab values, for example, have been recorded digitally since 1980s. There is a lot of data available in, in data lake infrastructure, which has been made in, at our hospital. And I just recently heard that uh, the, our data lake is the, um, the largest clinical data repository in Europe currently. Helsinki Biobank uh, has a population base of 2.3 million people, so about the same as Latvia, I think. Uh, and that's because most of the people have, are living close to this southern coast. We are owned by, also by Helsinki University, uh, sorry, the University of Helsinki. So there is a close collaboration between the university and the, and the hospital. Before going to the subject, it's really important to understand the rules of the game. And, and uh, in Nordic countries, the biobank law is, is quite similar, but there are differences. And, and in order to really return data back to the donors, it's good to know that the, um, the law has to be clear. The ethical sides and also the rights have to be there in place before you can really do it. And, and in Finland, the biobank law has been in operation for about 10 years, and it has proved, be, proved to be quite progressive. So there is a wide consent that we get from uh, sample donors. We can uh, transfer existing collections to the biobank, and we can uh, and we collect samples from uh, as a routine from healthcare during the normal. Uh, procedures. We can combine this rich real-world data with the samples and uh, very importantly we have the right to recontact the patients so we don't have to hesitate. If there is a reason we can recontact the patients and we can also serve the industrial customers as well. So looking at the biobank model in Finland it, it, it positions us uh, between the hospital and uh, research. And this is very good. So we are getting uh, consents and uh, samples and data from healthcare, and then we are delivering that to researchers. But I would like you to focus on the lower right corner, which is also dictated by the biobank law that we have to, if the patient asks, we have to give the data back to him or her. And if, if uh, there is some 
clinically relevant information, we should tell them. And this is tricky. How do we know what is clinically relevant? This is our consent form. And the red arrow actually shows the place where the sample donor should tick. So that she actually or he gives us the right to inform him or her when we find some clinically relevant information from the sample. And 99% uh, of the people actually tick this box and also the following box. And although this is an informed consent, we understand that people don't really understand what they are ticking. Then I tell you a couple of slides from about FinGen project, which is the largest uh, biobank project in, in Finland. And it's also one of the largest genome, genomic projects in, uh, worldwide, where uh, uh, we are collecting 500,000 consents and blood samples and DNA samples from, from Finland. So this project is run by Helsinki University and our biobank is responsible for coordinating the nationwide sample collection. All Finnish biobanks are actually participating in the, in the sample collection. And it's a GWAS, so Genome-wide Association Analysis Study. It's also uh, sponsored very greatly by uh, pharma companies. There are currently 13 pharma companies participating in this research. And um, the genomic data is then compared with the health register data and some hospital data. The FinGen project has been running nicely. It started in 2017. We have already delivered 4,000, 4, 430,000 samples to the project. And so we are close, we are in six months or so, we have uh, 500,000 delivered. So that's a very good situation for the project. And uh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> wrong slide. <laughs> so we, are, we have now almost all samples collected. But the problem comes now. We have, we have, by law, we need to deliver the clinically relevant information back to the participants. And of course, there is, because it's genomic data, it has genomic, uh, it has a relevance. And currently, we have got 300,000 patients genotypes back to the biobanks. And now we are developing together with the hospital professionals and the geneticists a process to utilize this data to really tell people whether they have a, a genomic risks. And we have chosen a pilot project where, where we have 64,000 patients' data. And um, it's from the FinGen Data Freeze 4, which was a couple of years ago. And uh, we have chosen these mutations, so the easy ones, I would say. So BRCA1, BRCA2, and PALB2, which is uh, highly enriched in Finland. And why? It's because there is a consensus that when having this genomic mutation, you truly have a risk. In this case for breast cancer, 40 to 80 percent in case of BRCA, and 30 to 60 percent risk for PALB2. So there will be not too much objections to why we are doing this. And also the other reason, of course, being that it, these are actionable variants. So we are actually piloting the whole process chain. So we are identifying, validating, recontacting, and the hospital is uh, counseling the patients. And we are only transferring the true positives to the healthcare. We are also collecting feedback from the patients during the process. And uh, based on the results, I think this will be implemented nationwide. Remember that in FinGen we have 500,000 people, so 10% of the population. So it's, a, it, it's potentially a, a big number of patients. And the results will be published next year. 
So I'm not able to tell you all the results, but uh, I can tell you the process. The process starts that uh, in, in that we look from the from our database and, and look for the uh, genomic data relevant for this particular case. We identify the sample donors because we of course know their true identity and we screen out those people who are already known to be carriers in, in the healthcare system. Then we do internal validation because the axiom uh, genotyping array is not really a clinically great ac acceptable way of uh, genotyping people. We are actually using a clinical grade analysis method using the hospital uh, genetics department. Then we, we recontact the patient and uh, we ask, what we ask is actually to, the permission to transfer this finding or, or can we transfer the finding to the healthcare. So we are, this step is only to ask whether we can do that. And if they say yes, and to our knowledge, so far about two thirds of the patients contacted say yes. And if you look at the numbers, I mean, you can check from literature that it's about 1% of the patients in this particular cohort that will have this, really have this uh, variant. Then we transfer the patients to healthcare or they are not necessarily patients. They, and, and actually what we have found that 80% uh, of the people who were contacting don't know and the healthcare doesn't know that they are carrier of these mutations. And what then happens is that the patient is recalled to give another sample to make sure that the biobank has not screwed up and has somehow mixed the tubes. And what we haven't so far, which is very good. So we have only delivered the, uh, the data from uh, true positives. And then what happens ne next is genetic counseling and then follow up and potential care. So this is ongoing as I told you. We are also collecting feedback and uh, some feedback is shown here. So it is surprisingly positive. So people, we are afraid that, okay, some people might not like it. We haven't had many people who have uh, kind of signed out from the biobank consent. So this is very encouraging, of course, for us to, to continue. And it's very important to notice that none of the responding individuals has regretted that they participated in the biobank project. So that's the situation now and, and hopefully next year then you will hear the complete story with all the numbers and, and images. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you. A, a very interesting story, actually. Uh, let me ask you the first question because we went through the similar procedure using hereditary hemochromatosis as a, as a, as a mutation for hereditary hemochromatosis as a, as a point, and of course, um, uh, that, that was also interesting. But my question is, um, okay, let's say what 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 do you see are the next steps? So because uh, at one point the, the most difficult decision would be the least of the uh, potential uh, mutations or, 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 or diseases uh, that, that will kind of would be approved for the, for the, for the reporting. Yeah. Have you thought about that? Of is, course, is we it have feasible or? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, first we have to prove that this is feasible. And uh, so far we haven't heard so many objections to the why are you doing this and this is useless. But of course, the difficulty comes when if we are talking about risk factors of other genes. And um, I don't know, I don't, we don't have a plan for the follow-up, follow really. And actually, we have to, of course, listen to the doctors and also the patients and be re really careful in, in returning the data otherwise. I know that our friends in Estonia, for example, they have done this type of things already for, for a number of years. 
but it also takes a lot of uh, uh, capacity from the healthcare. And actually, one uh, study we are doing at the same time is estimating the cost to healthcare. Because if you are, say it's 1% from 500,000 people, that's 5,000 people to be counseled. And, uh, and uh, so it's, uh, it's also a cost burden to the healthcare. Yeah, I think it's a challenge. So, other questions? Um, I, have, yeah, I have a question. I, I, I think that's really fascinating what you're doing here. So, when you're returning back the data, is it then possible then for these patients to submit these data to other analysis pipelines so that they submit their sequencing data and run it through different pipelines uh, which are available? And then they would give it to Biobank. Well, yeah. it hasn't happened so far. And, and we, I don't think we have a process for that, for taking in people-generated data. I think that would be useful for, for a certain project. So if, if a project wants to use our samples and data, then why not? Why not use also patient-reported data? And the next question, I, I think you, you need a high level of education in a way to tell the people what, yeah, what does this data mean? What does it mean that you have a risk uh, gene or something? Or do you have any educational program or are you just doing it like uh, that you're telling the people when they are coming to you? <laughs> and, uh, well, <laughs> we don't have the resources to give any educa education to the people, ordinary people. Uh -huh. But of course, they will learn. Those who are contacted, of course, they will, they will learn. And, and based on the feedback, the learning procedure is not so unpleasant. Yeah. <laughs> Impressive, yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, actually one final question. Do you have any feedback from the, uh, actually, can you access those people who didn't uh, agree to, or didn't respond to this uh, kind of share or uh, transfer of the data to the healthcare sector? Yes, yeah, so we, uh, we are now making a second round of, we first sent the letters, now we're actually trying SMS messages. Okay. Because some people don't read the letters or maybe the post office doesn't work. <laughs> because I think that, they, that this is very important to get at least the feedback why yes. they refuse yes. this or uh, whether it's just uh, not being informed or is there some other reason. Yeah. The first round was maybe 60-70% responses. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Peter Padrick uh, from the University of Tartu. He is an associate professor of oncology, uh, also a medical oncologist and uh, healthcare entrepreneur. Uh, and uh, uh, looking at uh, the, the cancer from different angle from the, uh, uh, taking into account the polygenic risk scores, yeah. Thank you. Uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, my presentation goes beyond uh, from biobanking and uh, my topic is actually precision prevention of common cancers uh, focused on uh, use of polygenic risk or technology. Uh, here are my disclosures and um, uh, we all know that cancer is a major healthcare problem and actually our risk risks uh, for everybody to get cancer during our lifetime is actually quite high. Uh, we can win many cancers using uh, prevention and early detection and for that uh, cancer screening programs are implemented. But currently uh, these programs consider only age of people. Like in case of breast cancer, uh, mammography screening from age 50 to 69 mostly, but actually our risks are very different. And uh, uh, new solutions could be personalized risk-based uh, prevention and screening. And we need tools for that. And genetic background actually is very important component uh, in case of many common cancers. Uh, you know that um, uh, already in use in healthcare are uh, tests uh, to detect uh, so-called single gene mutations or monogenic pathogenic variants. Like here in case of breast cancer, this yellow cloud 
of genes. Uh, but they are relatively rare. And uh, uh, research shows that uh, many uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms also influence uh, our uh, cancer risks and also risks for other diseases. And this part is not yet in use in healthcare. Uh, impact of every SNP is relatively small, uh, but they are common. And it's possible to analyze the complex impact of SNPs uh, using polygenic risk score technology. Uh, our approaches uh, are based a lot uh, of Estonian biobank activities. Uh, we have in Estonia 200,000 uh, individuals uh, included with genotype data uh, and also uh, collected phenotype data in uh, Biobank. And uh, 2018 to 21, we had a national clinical pilot project where exactly was uh, done uh, feedback uh, to Biobank participants uh, regarding breast cancer and uh, cardiovascular disease risks. And we uh, used uh, in this uh, approach uh, not only monogenic uh, variant uh, feedback, uh, but also we started to use polygenic risk score estimations. And uh, 890 women with high polygenic risk score in, were invited to this project and also uh, uh, 109 women with uh, detected uh, moderate or high risk monogenic variants. And actually, uh, the study modeling showed that we, with such approach, we can uh, uh, save 14 to 22 lives in Estonia every year. And uh, with quite cost efficient way, uh, so the quality adjusted life year cost is uh, a little bit less than. Uh, 7,000 euros, which is actually quite cost efficient. And also feedback from participants shows that, uh, uh, that um, uh, uh, the, this is information was uh, received quite well uh, from participants and uh, uh, we saw that most important thing is to, uh, to give exact uh, uh, recommendations for next steps, what to do uh, with high risk levels. Uh, Estonian data, for example, in case uh, of breast cancer shows that um, uh, we have approximately 2% uh, uh, among women of carriers of monogenic pathogenic variants, but we have up to 20% uh, of women who have moderate to high polygenic risk level. And uh, we know that uh, actually uh, such personalized screening is already implemented with international and national guidelines for monogenic uh, uh, mutation carriers. But actually it's quite clear that uh, uh, for ho all those high risk women, we should implement uh, screening differently than his current one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, from May this year, in European Union is uh, in full force uh, so-called in vitro medical device regulation, which says that genetic tests in European Union should be in the future uh, so-called C-marked in vitro medical devices or uh, uh, lab-developed tests, which have quite uh, strong restrictions also from regulatory side of view. And uh, this was exactly the reason uh, why uh, we uh, founded a company, Anta Genes, uh, which is a spin-off company from University of Tartu with aim uh, to develop and bring polygenic risk score technology into use on clinical grade level uh, in healthcare according to healthcare regulations. And currently, we have uh, developed and brought into use as uh, um, 
healthcare services for tests for breast, colorectal, prostate uh, cancers, and skin melanoma. And uh, in case of breast cancer, for example, you can see this uh, uh, green line here is uh, average breast cancer risk in Estonian population, but we can uh, uh, separate risk, high risk level and also low risk levels for breast cancer. Uh, and uh, of course, um, the uh, important thing is not uh, genetic testing or risk estimation, but actually the aim is to reduce uh, cancer mortality using uh, personalized uh, prevention programs. And uh, for example, uh, in case of breast cancer, uh, all women are invited currently for mammography screening from age 50. And uh, mammography after every two or three years in most countries and further management in case of mammography uh, findings. But uh, uh, looking for Estonian data, we see that uh, this screening group uh, covers only one proportion of breast cancer cases. Uh, younger women with higher risk levels are out from this screening. And at the same time, it's not reasonable to screen all younger women. And actually, uh, the no, uh, new model for that, therefore, which we are already implementing, is that uh, women from age 35 are offered uh, genetic testing, uh, both for polygenic risk score and monogenic pathogenic variants. And according to these risk levels, we can give recommendations when to start screening, how to do that, uh, and what uh, other uh, possible methods uh, or, or steps are possible to use to ris reduce risks. And uh, in uh, implementing polygenic risk scores, uh, uh, there are such principles like uh, equivalence of risk. So, uh, principally, societies have agreed that average risk level at age 50 is good enough to start mammography screening. But if uh, younger women have already higher risk level, then actually they should also receive screening earlier. And the uh, other, uh, other principle is uh, equitability. So if uh, some persons, they have access to prevention and screening, then actually other persons with similar risk levels should have also similar access. And maybe uh, third principle uh, regarding polygenic risk score is uh, uh, similarity of moderate risk uh, monogenic mutation carriers like, uh, uh, like uh, check 2 and ATM, for example, because polygenic risk score uh, shows similar risk levels. And we know that there are already international and national guidelines for these mutations, and we imp can implement similar approach for, uh, for polygenic risk score. And uh, uh, here, for example, we created such uh, uh, first guidelines uh, for polygenic risk score recommendations, uh, and we do not recommend to reduce current screening because uh, we think that uh, to uh, recommend that we need randomized studies to say that this is safe. But we recommend uh, uh, start screening when risk level reaches average risk level at age 50 and we recommend more intensive screening with those women who have higher uh, risk levels. Uh, from this year, Estonian Health Insurance Fund, who, who is such a uh, payer in Estonian healthcare, accepts uh, our polygenic risk score recommendations for breast cancer screening. So if we give these tests into healthcare, then women can use mammographies uh, which are already covered by health insurance. And we have also implemented such a, a model uh, for breast cancer precision prevention. Uh, we have ongoing uh, international projects uh, also uh, 
in no way Sweden and Portugal where we I, uh, are testing uh, similarly using such implementation research methods, uh, similar approach in, in these countries. And uh, principally, I can conclude that here is principally the uh, value proposition from polygenic risk or wealth care that we, if we can detect uh, uh, more precisely uh, risks, then we can implement uh, precision prevention programs and reduce with that uh, cancer uh, mortality. So, uh, principally, we can say that uh, uh, the future of uh, such personalized precision prevention is already available just now. And, uh, of course, there are a lot of questions to address uh, still. And we are looking also for international uh, research and implementations, cooperations in this field. Thank you very much and be healthy. Okay, thank you. Any question? Okay, I, I, I definitely have a question <laughs> because I, it always puzzles me how to deal with the communication with the, with the patients, especially in, the, in this area, how to report these polygenic risk scores if we think about the absolute value of, of this, this, this risk score. Because imagine that in, in two years when we have more uh, association uh, studies data, so you recalculate this risk score and it will definitely be different and maybe for some people you fall out of this, this uh, increased risk group. Uh, I wonder if you have thought about it, how to really communi communicate this to the people and uh, how often you actually should uh, like, like do this uh, recalculation or, or, or uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a very important question, absolutely. We have uh, dealt a lot of, uh, with this, actually. And we have uh, created such quite, uh, uh, quite uh, detailed and long report uh, uh, to explain uh, uh, these aspects. And this is, uh, Oviedo Convention says that uh, every, in case of every genetic test, the patient should have access to counseling. Uh, but it's not, uh, uh, we are in the process of such broader uh, implementation of genetics in healthcare. And uh, in every case, maybe it's not necessary such uh, doctor consultation. But uh, it's possible you, uh, to use also in written form or videos or different forms of counseling. Uh, but uh, exactly this information should be understandable. And therefore, we have such long written report with uh, pictures explaining uh, uh, th the uh, uh, meaning of these test results. And we, can, we can, uh, give a comparison, as polygenic risk score is actually comparison with other people in the same population, in the same age. Then we give this comparison and uh, try to explain visually uh, uh, what are the risk levels. This is a absolutely very important question. And also uh, for those, uh, uh, those individuals who want uh, additional counseling, we offer this possibility also. We use currently uh, telemedicine solutions for that, so no need to come uh, to doctor's consultation, but it's uh, uh, such video consultations, they work uh, quite well. Okay, uh, thank you. Other questions? Okay, if not, but, but really congratulations of, uh, for the, uh, to Estonia that you were managed to bring it to the next level, really, and implementing this in the screening. Of course, uh, I, I think it, it's, it's, it's very rarely that it is uh, done now on, on the polygenic risk score base, and I think it's very important to perform such studies to really see the uh, uh, efficacy of, of this approach. Actually, we have currently a similar problem that we have uh, two, uh, 200,000 uh, individuals with genotype data, like a uh, similar problem like in Finland. And, uh, and um, uh, we had a lot of uh, questions from our patients that uh, why we have to do again 
genotyping because we use exactly the same uh, method uh, as is used in Estonian biobank. And currently uh, there is project in Estonia which is uh, working out the ways how it's possible to transfer biobank data to healthcare biobank. Uh, uh, individuals, they have to give additional consent for that. And then, principally, for example, uh, such uh, test providers as we are, we can use already this available biobank data and give test uh, results according to healthcare regulations based on earlier genotyping. Of course, this earlier genotyping must be done according to quality criteria, what, what are necessary for healthcare use. Uh, uh, this is why we have this in vitro medical device regulation in Europe. Uh, but uh, we uh, actually uh, thought what to do and then we implemented such, uh, how to say, not uh, finally, not the very patient-friendly solution, but this was the best we could do. And this was so that if uh, biobank participants, they uh, asked their genotype data out from biobank, then biobank uh, gave, uh, gave this to them, uh, uh, such, uh, uh, we have such uh, possibility to uh, uh, crypt data and they crypt with identity card in Estonia. And so they uh, received this scripted genetic data, they, they crypted themselves this and uploaded it to our server. And so we could, uh, we could then give also these test results to using this already available biobank data. And actually we received uh, uh, such um, uh, Citra Innovation Fund in Finland made uh, competition of uh, uh, fairly data use in healthcare. We, we were one of winners 2021, I think, uh, about this approach. So uh, I think, but similar questions we see in every country and this uh, should, be, uh, should be solved. Uh, so the regulations are, regulations are followed and also um, a clinical impact is there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we can now move to the next speaker. Uh, uh, next speaker is uh, Ilmar Stanans, uh, who is Deputy Director at the Institute of uh, Clinical and Preventive Medicine, University of Latvia. Yeah, floor is yours. Uh, thank you for, for your introduction. Uh, I'm here with uh, another story, another example of biobanking. Uh, in this case, uh, it's a story about uh, how biobanking emerged from cooperation between hospital and uh, academic partner. In this case, Institute of uh, Clinical and Preventive Medicine, University of Latvia, and the Riga East University Hospital. <clears throat> Next slide. Ah. Okay. Uh, I'll begin with this slide, actually, um, the ideal biobanking uh, from the perspective of the patient pathway. Uh, it shows how many possibilities of uh, uh, sampling do we have for biobank on the patient pathway through uh, cancer therapy. So prior to therapy, directly before surgery, during uh, the uh, follow-up therapy, and uh, the possibility is to use these samples not only for biobanking itself, keeping in biobank, but also the possibilities to use these samples for further analyses uh, in uh, disease models or as derivatives for sequencing and so on. Um, it's an ideal situation and this would be perfect to have something like that. But 
it never happened. And that's why me myself prefer to keep things simple. And I have simplified here the process of beer banking with the buy bank being somewhere in the middle of this process. Because initially, initially patients or healthy people are there who agree to donate their blood tissues, biofluids, or microbiome too. Uh, and then these samples are stored in the biobank, which itself is a framework dealing with quality management, ethical, legal, compliance, process management, with a lot of SOPs in place. And then two main components of Biobank are there. On the one hand, samples which have to be collected, stored, processed, and at the end of the story distributed. And uh, another part, sometimes even more important part, these are metadata about these samples all the possible <clears throat> additional data uh, about medical history, imaging, histology, uh, lifestyle, and so on. Uh, it has been, uh, it has today already been mentioned that Biobank is somewhere in the middle between hospital and research. In our case, um, presenting you an example where hospital and research came together and uh, uh, it resulted in uh, the collaboration for biobanking, specifically for biobanking uh, for cancer patient tissues. Uh, historically, it began about a decade before uh, and as usual, finances are important and financial support uh, came from European uh, Social Fund project, uh, interdisciplinary research group for early tumor diagnosis and prevention. Uh, this resulted later on in formal establishment of tissue center uh, within Riga East University Hospital. And a couple of years later, when our institute, Institute of Clinical <clears throat> and Preventive Medicine of University of Latvia was established, we already had Biobank as one of our structural units. Um, this model brings uh, the best possible competencies from both from hospital and from academia. And it has to be mentioned that hospital surely ensures proximity to patient, clinical competencies, and the possibilities of pathological lab, along the other good things you can have in the hospital. On the side of academia, of course, uh, the research competencies are stronger as well as experience in additional acquisition of financing, uh, which is always important to uh, have a biobank. And uh, in our case, also data system management is provided uh, on the side of university. Uh, during uh, these years, um, altogether collection of samples, uh, altogether uh, biobank uh, participants are a bit more than 8,000, and 4,300 of them are cancer patients. Uh, of course, we do have all the necessary hardware in place, partially on the side of hospital, partially on the side of uh, 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 our institute. And these are altogether more than 20 freezers. We have the possibility for liquid nitrogen storage, all the necessary 
small hardware for um, sample coding and uh, sample processing before biobanking, as well as uh, equipment needed for DNA isolation and also <clears> the <throat> possibility of sampling of uh, breath samples. Um, we have chosen for information system the solution based on a Microsoft uh, SQL server, which is located uh, in hospital, so all the data are uh, physically present there and uh, uh, preserved uh, and, and, uh, by, by, um, and isolated from others uh, by uh, firewall. Uh, uh, the users of the uh, information system can uh, use it through Microsoft Access based information system. Um, Microsoft Access was chosen um, because of its flexibility uh, to uh, generate different types of data entry models. What we have learned from our experience is that if we want to uh, collect uh, the largest possible uh, information about the patients, uh, beginning from questionnaires and uh, including all the possible medical data, then uh, we can't have a unique data entry model for all kinds of cancers for all types of cancers. That's why they uh, differ a bit depending on the initially diagnosed type of cancer. Um, and uh, here are two collections of uh, uh, biobanks uh, or two biobank collections which are running uh, under the administration of our institute. On the one hand, the first one is Clinical Biobank. We are running uh, in cooperation with Riga East University Hospital. As already told, it has uh, uh, 3, 000, uh, 8,300 patients already in it with uh, more than 90,000 different samples collected and uh, in parallel, we also have in the Institute another population uh, uh, biobank project, biobank based on uh, uh, gastric cancer screening. It's even larger with 10,000 participants and more than 200,000 different samples. Uh, uh, we try to collect as much uh, different samples, uh, types of samples uh, as possible. Uh, usual the standard is blood, whole blood, sera. Um, but also we are collected quite regularly fecal samples and for uh, the cancer patients uh, undergoing surgery, those are also surgical samples, frozen surgical samples or bi um, bi biopsy samples, as well as saliva and exhaled air samples, uh, because our institute is dealing with uh, volatile markers of cancer. And uh, if getting back to our clinical collection of cancer patients, uh, then uh, we see that it is the largest one if we are dealing uh, with the uh, uh, biobank uh, run together with uh, Riga East University Hospital. The largest proportions of the all clinical ca uh, cases are cancer patients. Uh, with the largest collections being for stomach cancer, uh, colorectal cancer and breast cancer. 
Um, of course, this would be useless to have a biobank without using the samples. Uh, and these are the examples of the projects linked to biobank. Uh, I'm using uh, the term linked uh, because uh, these projects are not only using the samples we have collected. Uh, the majority of these uh, projects are also contributing for the collection of the new samples for Biobank. Uh, a lot of them being, as already mentioned, linked to our interests <coughs> uh, in volatile markers. We uh, also, uh, in the last time, uh, engaging us in million microbiome of human project. Uh, uh, ethical aspects of biobanking have been also attributed, as well as uh, lung cancer uh, markers. Um, we are proud to be part of uh, Latvian Biobank Network, along with other uh, colleagues being present here uh, today too. And uh, we are also proud to be uh, listed in BBMRI ERIC directory along uh, with another Latvian biobank genome database of Latvian population. And thank you. Thank you uh, for this uh, really informative presentation. Uh, any questions? You say, I have a question. I was impressed about your breathing samples. So, um, I mean, there must be a large volume. So, how you store them at minus 80 freezers or sorry, sorry. the, the breath breathing samples? Uh, yeah. okay. So, how, you, how many samples do you have from this uh, breathing? Uh, Okay, there are different uh, methodologies uh, to collect them. Uh, there are solvents uh, which are used to collect them, then they can be uh, deserved uh, and used for analysis, for example, with, uh, with, with uh, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry. Another possibility is simply to collect the samples in this, uh, the specific bags. Most of these samples are already used uh, uh, within the research project, so uh, they uh, and they can't be really uh, 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 stored for a long time. Okay, we have a question there from the audience. Does it work? Yeah, now it works. Uh, I saw uh, today uh, in a row m many presentations uh, informing about how many biobanks are Latvia, in Latvia are um, there already. Um, just as a concept, uh, is it imaginable to merge those into one biobank? Uh, would it be maybe cost effective or, or is it unpractical? What maybe are there any points for discussion? We have uh, some guests here from, from uh, um, um, other countries. So maybe you have a comment, uh, Dr. Baumbusch, about, about this. Do you think every uh, clinic should have its own biobank? Is, it, is that good? Uh, what this question to me? <laughs> to everyone for discussion. I just thought. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, uh, of course, I have an opinion about that. Uh, and we had also with Janis uh, a couple of years earlier discussion about that. Uh, of course, centralized model has it uh, uh, good sides for it. Uh, on the other hand, centralized model can't always take into account all the clinical aspects. And as I mentioned, I believe that simply to have sample is not enough. Um, and uh, what we are facing from day to day is, do you have samples? Yes, we do. But can you tell us if these samples are coming from cancer patients? Yes. Are they coming from gastrointestinal cancer patients? Yes. Are they coming from colon cancer patients? 
And uh, we can go deeper and deeper. Uh, are they from women? Are they from children? Are they from uh, uh, how old are the patients? Uh, where they did they had chemotherapy, forehead or not? Uh, genetic uh, family, uh, family history, and so on and so on. So these metadata are extremely important. And you can't have, for all types of clinical cases, unified metadata uh, templates. So I believe uh, the best solution is the cooperation between centralized biobanks bio where it's possible. And it's definitely possible uh, for the genomic databases. Um, <clears throat> in the fact, we are cooperating with a uh, genomic database of Latin population, and we are sending a lot of our samples uh, to a um, uh, biomedical center for them to perform all the possible uh, sequencing uh, procedures uh, so we can complement each other. On the one hand, clinical data and tissue samples. On the other hand, genomic data. Yeah. If, if I can comment on that, I think also that uh, we, we first, first we should be very practical and I think really see what is the most cost efficient variant. Uh, the, 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 not, not only just thinking of the really putting uh, everything in one place, if it's not effective, it, it also won't be uh, really feasible to do so. And, and I think that which is really mo most important uh, question is not uh, actually how the, where the samples are kept, but uh, to follow the, some, some uh, principles for the quality control, which uh, is possible to establish in this network. And this is the one of the goals of the BBMRI actually to really um, to, to at least to understand what, what are these, these uh, uh, quality uh, issues uh, to deal with. And uh, of course, the next level is the data. If uh, you can exchange uh, freely with the data and that they are, they, they are harmonized between biobanks, so that, that already is a major goal uh, to, to, to really be. And I think we are uh, in going to the right direction. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I guess uh, this is uh, all for today. Uh, really, first of all, I would like to thank all the speakers and uh, we are almost in time, only five minutes uh, late. So this is amazing, I guess. Uh, thank you. And also for the, all the listeners that, uh, that are here and uh, see you tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much.